Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Julie Steck, and I'm a psychologist here at CRG Children's Resource Group. And I want to welcome you all to today's webinar, Unlocking the Mystery of Nonverbal Learning Disorder. Uh, this is a presentation that we've put together to help those of you who are parents or teachers or psychologists better understand what nonverbal learning disorder is, how it affects individuals, and what we can do about it. I will be presenting today with Dr. Ray Kinder. Let me turn the computer and let you meet Dr. Hello. Kinder. Hello. Glad you could join us. And this is Dr. Jill Wise, our pediatric neuropsychologist. Hello. Once we start presenting, we're going to turn uh, our webcams off so we can focus on our content and not worry about how we appear to you all. Uh, but we'll be starting with Dr. Kinder today, giving an overview and a kind of a deeper understanding of nonverbal learning disorder. We will then talk about the developmental progression of nonverbal learning disorder and then talk about the evaluation of nonverbal learning disorder. We will allow time for questions at the end of this session. If you have questions or uh, have want to make comments, you can do that through the question feature at the bottom of your screen. I also want to let you know that you are able to download our PowerPoint from today. If you look down on your toolbar, it says handouts one of five, and you should be able to download our PowerPoint in PDF form. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Kinder, who will uh, begin our presentation. Thank you. I'm glad you're all able to join us uh, here over your lunch hour, uh, for some of you anyway. And, uh, you know, uh, this topic of nonverbal learning disab disabilities has been an area of interest of mine for quite a while, actually. And uh, so I'm glad we're doing this. For some of you, you probably already have a working knowledge of it, and hopefully we can add to that today. Um, but for some of you, it, it's probably gonna be a relatively new concept. And it's not an easy, if, you, if it's new to you, it's not an easy concept to kind of wrap your mind around. I've even had colleagues here at the office who have dealt with it and continue to tell me that it's difficult sometimes for them to understand why it would be so difficult for someone to process information that we just do so readily on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I thought I might do to help you uh, is to give some examples that I think might, might be of assistance in wrapping your mind around this concept and this disorder. Um, I'm gonna start off with a little story about Henry Henry is a, it's a fictional story. Henry's a seventh grader at Summit Middle School. And Henry is a new student there. Uh, they moved in mid-year, his family did. And so he's been to the Summit Middle School about three weeks. Uh, so he's going into his fourth week. Uh, this, the morning that we're gonna talk about, Henry had his annual physical uh, with his pediatrician and his mom had scheduled for early in the morning. So he was getting to school at about a little bit before fourth period, so midday. So Henry gets to school. He knows he's got to go to the office and get a pass. So he does that. And he comes out of the office, goes down the hallway, and quickly realizes he's lost. Not totally lost, but he's disoriented. He doesn't know where to go to get to Mr. Wilson's fourth period social studies class, which is where he's supposed to be. So, but Henry wanders for a little bit and then he figures out that, okay, I just need to go back to the entryway that I come in every day. So he goes back to where the bus lets him off and he goes in through that entryway into the building. From there, he locates his first period class, and then he is successful locating his second period class. And he's on his way to where his third period class is when he sees the hallway and recognizes, oh, this is where my social studies class is. So he heads down that hallway, and he successfully then goes into Mr. Wilson's social studies class. He's late, so he gives Mr. Wilson his pass, 
Mr. Wilson says, well, Henry, I'm glad you made it. Hey, what we're doing today, we're going over gross domestic product for the countries for Latin America and South American countries. So on the overhead is a map showing those countries, and we're trying to come up with that map for you. Um, and the countries are color coded. All the Latin American countries are different colors and the social studies. Success, all right, here we go. All right, so this is what Henry's looking at on the overhead and the rest of the students as well. So what Mr. Wilson is doing, he's going around, he's calling different, on different students and he's asking them and he's giving them the country that he wants and he's asking for the population or the gross domestic product increase for the decade 2000 to 2009. And um, it's a percentage increase. Um, so, or he's asking for both of those figures from the student. So he goes to about a half a dozen students and they are giving him the information pretty successfully. But then he calls on Henry and Henry freezes. Henry's not able to give Mr. Wilson the answer. In fact, Henry doesn't say anything. So after a kind of a pregnant pause, kind of awkward, Mr. Wilson goes, Henry, that's okay. And he moves on, calls on someone else who quickly gives the correct answer. Now, most of us can empathize with Henry's situation and recognize he was probably embarrassed. Um, for those of you who can't, um, we have another seminar we recommend for you, but, but I digress, we won't go there. Um, so the, you have to recognize Henry had a lot of difficulty processing the visual spatial information that was coming to him. Now, we could hype one hypothesis might be that was Henry was anxious. Uh, he'd already was running late. He didn't want to be necessarily the center of attention. And we see lots of kids who don't want to be the center of attention and they'll freeze when that happens for them. But actually in Henry's case, it, it wasn't that much anxiety. Henry has a nonverbal learning disability and any information that comes to Henry visually and spatially, he has difficulty processing. Now you can, now you gotta remember, he missed Mr. Wilson's very excellent, because he's a good teacher, excellent verbal sequential explanation of how to interpret both the map and the graph. And he gave that at the beginning of the period, but Henry wasn't there to hear it. So he missed that part, okay? So that's one, and it had, had he heard it, uh, he may not have had that much difficulty in coming up with an answer. Would have, might, have, might have taken him a little longer than some students, but he might have gotten there. Now, you might also remember that Henry, in this circumstance, couldn't orient from the office to Mr. Wilson's social studies class, not directly. And it took him a while, okay? Well, Henry, having a nonverbal learning disability, does not have the floor plan in his head, that visual spatial representation that a lot of us have and a lot of the students have at, the, at Summit Middle School. If you think about it, Henry really did a pretty good job of problem solving that because what he did, he went back to an orientation he knew and he visually sequentially processed what he needed to to get to Mr. Wilson's class. So we really had a pretty good problem solving strategy to compensate in that instance for his nonverbal learning disability, but it took him longer. So you might, you might remember that. Well, oh, okay. In, um, oh, one other thing I wanted to give you, I gave you another example that might be helpful for you. So um, CRG is at 91st and Meridian. So let's say that you're all here and you've just heard this scintillating presentation from all of us about nonverbal learning disabilities and we're getting ready to leave 
but somebody has a brilliant idea and says, hey, let's meet for cocktails at Divi's in downtown Carmel. Just so happens that the main server for Google Maps is down. You don't have that tool. So how would you want me to give you directions from here to Divi's? Would you want me to draw you a map, Xerox it off and give it to all of you? Would you want me to give you directions using north, south, east, and west? Sequential directions written out using the street names? How you prefer to get those directions gives you some insight into your own preferred mode of processing. And if you are an individual who said, oh gosh, Dr. Kinder, don't give me a map, I'm terrible at maps. Or, oh, I never know which direction's north. You know, that'll, that won't help me. Then you're an individual who probably uh, has an advantage in understanding your nonverbal LD, kids, students, and adults, because you prefer the processing of information more verbally sequentially, which is what they need to help them compensate. So you might remember that and think about that as you, uh, as you understand more about nonverbal learning disability. In uh, the slide you see up um, is Byron Rourke's book published in 1989 regarding nonverbal learning disabilities, the syndrome and the model. This was groundbreaking because it was the first book that I ever read, and I think one of the first books in the field that really described nonverbal learning disabilities. And, and Rourke did an excellent job. And um, he, he gave us a lot of information, but he, he really introduced it to the field. Oops. What he helped us to realize is we needed to um, watch for nonverbal versus verbal splits. And he also talked a lot about spatial processing. But at that juncture in time, when that book came out, Dr. Steck and I, Julie and I were in a different private practice. But in that practice, and we opened CRG in 1993, so actually in both practices, we were doing a lot of testing and assessment. We were doing psychoeducational evaluations and psychological evaluations on kids and adolescents primarily uh, during that era. And we were seeing this pattern. So that's why Rourke's book really intrigued us because we were seeing these kids with had significant, statistically significant differences in their verbal and nonverbal skills, which shows up readily on a whisk, but it would show up with other uh, instruments as well. And then this nonverbal being weaker, and we were seeing these kids that had uh, much more difficulty with math than they did with language arts. We saw those kids as having difficulty with, with puzzles, um, with um, block design off of the whisk for those of you who are clinicians. But they also had some difficulty with handwriting. They weren't great at that. They weren't good at drawing or copying designs. Uh, they could have some difficulty socially. Um, we were seeing these kids have anxiety and it's not on your, um, it's not on the PowerPoint, but also some uh, mild attention issues seemed to emerge for some of these kids. We were we were seeing. Um, so at the time, I thought, I really did believe, maybe naively, that um, what was going to evolve shortly thereafter was a, a, a clarity in the definition of nonverbal learning disability. Um, I actually thought that uh, the psychologists across the country were probably seeing that just like uh, Julie and I were seeing it and that we would get a push from psychologists at least to get a definition in DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that we utilize for diagnosing. I also thought that uh, Julie and I were working a lot with schools and school systems. I actually thought that we, following probably DSM, that we'd get a definition in special ed law for a nonverbal learning disability. And the real advantage there is we'd get links to educational interventions that could help these kids, but there no consensus emerged um, on, the, on the definition. And if you don't get consensus on the definition, you, you don't get people developing targeted treatments. 
they can't agree on what it is, they can't always agree on how to treat it. So that was discouraging. Um, along that same time period or shortly thereafter, there were some professionals who saw nonverbal learning disabilities as a subset of autism, uh, or, or, or there was some confusion on how you would differentially diagnose the two. Well, <clears throat> they can both have similar symptoms revolving around social, since, such as difficulties in reading nonverbal cues, in uh, reading body language, uh, reading facial expression of emotions, um, recognition of body space, you know, the distance between individuals and what's comfortable for people. So they have a lot of similar sort of clues or, or uh, symptoms, however, but they are uh, something I want to emphasize. They are distinct entities. Uh, and we see kids, having done quite a bit of this, we see kids on the autism spectrum who have excellent math ability. In fact, they can, some of them can have amazing math abilities. We see kids that are nonverbal learning disabled who are very social, in some cases, uh, annoyingly social, asking lots and lots of questions um, of people because uh, they need that information. So uh, a point of clarification, they're, they're a distinct entity. Um, let me follow that up. So if you have no consensus in, in the field, um, as a result of that, then there, there weren't formal training programs developed to educate people about nonverbal learning disabilities. And that was true for both clinicians, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, et cetera, but also for educators. Now, there's probably some educators in the office, so in the audience. So by all means, when it comes to the time for questions, clarify for me if, if, that, if that's not true. For instance, if you are getting some educating, educational courses about nonverbal learning disabilities, but I've had a lot of teachers tell me that they've got no training on it and that they really don't understand it. What happens then, if you're going to become knowledge about it, knowledgeable about it, you have to seek out seminars like this or webinars like this from people like Julie and I and Jill who who are dealing with it and can give you knowledge about it. Um, but not everybody's going to do that. So there's a wide variance out there in the field regarding knowledge and a, and a level of competency with diagnosing it and understanding it. So if you so without that, there's a lot of individuals with nonverbal learning disabilities that do not get the guidance that they need. Julie's going to go into a lot of good information for us about the developmental progression and symptoms at each age level. But I wanted to, but I thought the more examples we could give you, the better off you're gonna be. So I wanted to give you some symptoms uh, and uh, talk just briefly about a few things um, related to nonverbal learning disabilities. I think one of the real keys, and I think it's gonna emerge if we ever do get consensus, I think the consensus is gonna emerge around the visual spatial reasoning. Um, because that seems to be a, just a huge piece of the, of the puzzle. Um, and uh, so how you, we see that with kids. We, we, we have kids do puzzles. I actually have a lot of puzzles in my office. And uh, they don't do puzzles well. And so and they, in building, which is visual spatial integration, if you think about it, they oftentimes don't do that well either. So questions you can give parents, for instance, about their kids is, did they really get into puzzles? Did they really do a lot of building with Legos or connects when they were younger? Typically, the parents will say, you know, no, their brother did or their sister did, but they didn't, they really weren't into it. If they do build with Legos, they're going to do it uh, visually sequentially and they're going to follow the directions. Organization and synthesis of information. I, I think of big picture reasoning. Uh, so you, you, kids uh, with nonverbal learning disabilities can have a lack of common sense because they don't always do the big picture well and know how a smaller piece integrates into the big picture. 
visual recall, where's your car, where's my car keys, where's the exit, you know, Henry was a good example of that. He couldn't, he couldn't locate the classroom. Now, over time, Henry will, will get better at navigating Summit Middle School, but he doesn't have that visual spatial plane. Uh, motor, uh, they can have difficulty with drawing, fine motor skills and be clumsy. Those of you who are clinicians out there and do benders, keep doing them. The bender gestalt test has been around forever and it's not gonna go out of style because it gives us a lot of information because it's a design copying task with, and the current one has um, three dimensional drawings that kids have to do. And it's interesting to see some kids struggle with those. I talked about so social interpretive skills re related to autism. Math concepts, the thing you watch for is applied math. You can do math verbally sequentially, you can do algebra verbally sequentially. You can do a lot of math visually sequentially, but when it comes to geometry, when it comes to applying math concepts, you're back to really pulling on spatial reasoning to do that and do that well. And these individuals have difficulty with that. Uh, some ab abstract concepts, you get, to, you get to higher level thinking and abstract concepts like slavery in the Civil War. Think of slavery as the hub of a wheel and spinning off of that all the implications from slavery. So you could do multiple essays on it. Well, these kids have trouble thinking in that level of complexity. Organization, we organize, we organize ourselves over space and time. Uh, these kids have difficulty in doing that. They'll have trouble with um, uh, anal uh, analog clocks and uh, if they'll prefer digital. Uh, because that's because an analog clock interpretation is spatial. Uh, sarcasm, literal, literal interpretations. The way to think about that with our nonverbal LD kids, their preferred mode to process is verbally sequentially. So they want to take that verbal information at face value. They don't want to have to stop and think, oh, does he mean the opposite? You know, is this is he poking fun? Is there humor here? They, they want to take that verbal sequential information that's come to them as the Bible, and they want to run with that. Uh, change, they prefer sameness. You can put yourself in Henry's shoes, and uh, if the principal decided on a day to change the schedule in a major fashion to accommodate a, an assembly or something, Henry locating the classes with the schedule change is going to be difficult. Henry wants that schedule to stay just the same. Thank you. So this is Julie Stack, and I'm going to take over the mic at this time. So nonverbal learning disorders are neurodevelopmental disorders. In other words, they begin early in life and continue. They do not go away. Um, but nonverbal learning disorders tend to have a developmental sequence different than many others in that the uh, uh, it be, they be, nonverbal learning disorders become more apparent over time as opposed to less apparent. So let's talk about what places an individual at risk for nonverbal learning disorder. So we know that there are some factors that would make us question whether we should look for a nonverbal learning disorder. Traumatic birth history, including prematurity, places an individual at risk. Neural, neural tube defects, including spina bifida. No neurologic conditions, such as cerebral palsy or seizure disorders. Having an autism spectrum disorder puts you at risk or other learning disorders, including nonverbal learning disorders. And having a nonverbal learning disorder places you at greater risk for autism spectrum disorder, although, as Dr. Kinder said, they are two distinct entities. And family history of math learning disorders. So nonverbal learning disorders are highly associated with neurologic factors. That doesn't mean every child who has a nonverbal learning disorder will have a neurological diagnosis prior to diagnosis of NVLD. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the developmental progression of nonverbal learning disorders. 
So prior to grade one, or really in um, infancy, toddlerhood, early childhood, many of the signs of nonverbal learning disorders are seen by adults around them as positive traits. They tend to develop their language, early language well. They have strong rote learning and verbal memory, so they memorize nursery rhymes and songs and the ABCs. They memorize that information very well. They ask lots of questions. And in fact, they probably ask too many questions. They ask questions that most children don't need to ask, and they will ask them repetitive, repetitively. They are very comfortable with conversation, especially with adults, because they're very verbal. But they may have slower motor development or be somewhat uncoordinated. They may have separation anxiety in new situations because they're not well oriented to their physical environment. And their dislike for spatial organizational tasks, such as puzzles and avoidance of fine motor activities, isn't really taken as seriously as it probably should be because adults say, oh, but they're so smart, they talk so well, it's just that they're not interested in puzzles and drawings. And that may be true for some children, but that should be a tip off that this child is not following a normal developmental progression. In early elementary school, we begin to see more signs. Um, these children are perceived as bright to, due to their strong verbal skills. They acquire early reading skills easily in most cases. We'll find some cases where they have reading difficulties, uh, but typically they acquire their reading skills easily. Uh, they have friendships, um, but they typically do better with just one friend at a time. They're very conscientious regarding their schoolwork. They tend to work slowly. They have poor handwriting. They have trouble copying from the board. And we start to see increasing anxiety in new situations and kind of a lack of common sense. If they get in trouble, it's um, for talking. It's not usually for disruptive behaviors. And in early elementary, we may see them somewhere around third grade start to fall behind in math. And as I said earlier, we see more signs of anxiety emerging. In middle schools, we often hear teachers or parents say they're just not motivated, they're not trying. They're so smart, but they're just not trying in math. Um, we see them start to struggle with math and the physical sciences, like the physics concepts, chemistry concepts. And despite their strong verbal and basic reading skills, we see more difficulty with reading comprehension. So around middle school, we start to see their grades drop off pretty dramatically. They tend to have poor study habits, and that tends to be due to trouble with organization, trouble with attention, trouble with developing the visual spatial underpinnings for learning. And we see uh, disorganization. Um, and around this time, we start to see more trouble with peers because they just struggle with larger group settings and quickly processing the nonverbal information, uh, like where should I stand in a group? Am I too close to a person? Is this a group I should um, begin to try to interact with, or are they sending me body language that I should avoid? And so the anxiety and or attention problems, and I will keep saying usually both, start to become more apparent in middle school. By high school, we are really seeing the impact of the nonverbal learning disorder. Increased academic difficulties, more anxiety, as they, we tend to see these um, these teenagers not really want to learn to drive. They don't have good awareness of how to get places. They have poor sense of direction. They're easily distracted. And their anxiety makes them not want to learn to drive. And I would say to parents, listen to their anxiety and proceed with driving slowly. They'll, they, many of them learn to drive fine, 
just takes them long. Their peer groups are shrinking. We see more anxiety. And if not recognized, if the nonverbal learning disorder and the anxiety are not recognized, we can see them develop depression. Lots more struggles with the higher level math concepts and physical sciences. And as learning becomes more abstract, we see them struggle more. And so, of course, with all those difficulties, we see a decline in self-concept. Um, so I think what we want to think about is what can we do to support these individuals? So we're going to talk next about assessment and then interventions. Okay, so this is Jill Wise talking now, and I will be talking about assessment. That is one of my roles here at CRG. And what I will be talking about is if you're a parent, or a teacher, or a psychologist, the different domains to be expected when your child or adolescent goes through an evaluation. And when I'm conducting the evaluation, sometimes I have an idea based on the child's diagnosis, which is spina bifida. I might be looking for a nonverbal learning disability, so I will tailor my battery before I administer it anyways. If not, I can make changes as needed if I start to see a learning profile that looks like a nonverbal learning disability. So first off, we started looking at overall intellectual cognitive abilities. So as Dr. Kinder said, this is something like a WISC. This is getting an overall IQ score. And then also looking at if that pattern of strengths and weaknesses starts to develop. Are their verbal skills better developed than their nonverbal, visual spatial problem solving skills? And if so, from the start, then that gives us a way to look at even more in depth in terms of patterns of strengths and weaknesses. We'll also get an idea of their working memory, so short-term memory. This is what I explain to parents as if you were looking up a phone number in a phone book and then had to remember it for a short period of time, and then you can forget about it. That's working memory. Processing speed is how quickly we can get things done. Sometimes individuals with NVLD or nonverbal learning disorders do show slowed processing speed. A lot of times it's very much related to attention. So first off, we'll get that overall cognitive level. And now you'll see this picture. So this is a very simplistic image of our brain. So we have it our left side, our right side. When we think about nonverbal learning disabilities, we're really thinking about that right hemisphere having those weaknesses. Like Dr. Speck said, we may not, we may know why. They may have a seizure disorder that's in the right hemisphere. They may have had an insult at delivery, like a stroke that's in their right hemisphere that's causing that. If not, we just may not know. For myself, when I do an evaluation and I'm looking at MVLD, I actually write on my notepad after I administer the assessment and write their strengths and weaknesses on the left side and right side and see if it lines up. So this is just another way to really think through things when we see our patient. So after I, of course, do their overall IQ score and see if that pattern arises, I'll look at verbal and nonverbal learning and memory. So what does this look like? In individuals with MVLD, we'd expect a strength in their verbal learning and memory. So this is how they learn words when they're presented in lists. So they may be given a list five times over and over, and we're looking at do they take in new words with each time it's read? Do they remember them later on? Do they perform better with cues to help prompt their recall? I'm also always looking at the efficiency with which individuals are learning new verbal words. So if I read them a list of 15 words, are they just trying to remember them in the exact order that I said them? which tends to be less efficient than if they're clustering the words in different groups. So if the list includes boys' names, girls' names, animals, and food, do they start to cluster them? So individuals with higher problem-solving skills do better than with remembering. I also read stories to see if individuals learn better when presented with context versus with words. And then we'll switch over to the nonverbal or visual spatial learning and memory. So these are pictures, shapes, spatial location, and I'm not only interested in what they remember, but also where. So a lot of times kids will remember either the content of whatever I showed them. So it might be a screen that has pictures at different locations, or they'll remember just the locations and don't quite take in what the content was. A lot of things go into verbal memory. So it's not typically a frank deficit in visual spatial memory. It's more so related to attention and executive function, so how they organize the information. I'll then look at their language skills. So again, we want to get that pattern of the positives and negatives. Individuals with um, MVLD will have better vocabulary skills, expressive language, so what they say, 
and receptive language. So I will do different tasks to administer those and find out how they're doing. Different tasks of um, attention executive functioning. So individuals with MVLD will do relatively better on verbal or auditory attention. So again, those list learning tasks that I read to them, it's not only looking at verbal learning and memory, but it's also getting at attention because of course, if it's not getting in their brain, then they're not going to be able to retrieve it. So they may show a strength in that. It could be attention that's um, hurting them in that respect. But then we do tasks of visual, spatial attention, inhibition, and impulsivity. And we do find that individuals with NVLD show weaknesses in this domain. Executive functioning. So parents and teachers of kids with MVLD, a lot of times they come in and they say, their bedroom's a mess, their locker's a mess, they can't find their homework. When they do, and they do complete it, we don't always turn it in. If I give them three things to do at once, we get distracted before the first. These are all aspects of executive functioning. Also, just learning from past mistakes. So our individuals making a mistake and then we go through and tell them what they did wrong. They may continue to make that mistake, especially if it's in a new context. We even think about that in the classroom. A child may fully understand one concept at one point in time, but then when we have to generalize that, especially when we get older, we struggle with that ability. So we certainly look at different areas of attention executive functioning, and those tend to be areas of weakness for individuals with MVLD. I will do, or psychologists will do additional assessments of visual spatial skills. So not only those visual spatial skills that we do on core cognitive assessment, which does have several and gives us a lot of good information, but if we do have a specific concern with MVLD, we can do additional measures of visual and spatial perception. So it might be a picture of one image that's disjointed and the child has to put it together in their mind and say what it might be. We could do additional tasks of visual constructive skills. So we tend to see these to be areas of weakness. I've had individuals who they do very well if they copy exactly what they're doing, but a lot of times the way that they do it is in a disorganized manner. So for example, I show them one large image and ask them to copy it. They don't tend to see the picture as a whole. They see different bits and pieces of that image and then the way that they copy it is very disjointed, which then of course impacts memory and how we later recall it. I, we do tasks of fine motor skills. So we'd expect some rote motor skills like finger tapping to be just fine. But when we do more complex motor skills, so we use pegboards where individuals have to put pegs in holes and they have to maneuver them around, they tend to struggle with this task. Um, if there was a child who had neurological insult to the right hemisphere, which is what we're looking at, then their left hand may be weaker, but we'd expect a lot of times just with kids with MBL, both hands to be weak on these types of tasks, which could, of course can impact writing, note-taking, tying our shoes. Then we look at academic skills. So reading, math, and writing. This not only gives us information about how the child's doing now, but also then how we can intervene with them. So for reading, their rote reading skills and reading fluency might be just fine. We're getting through those early elementary school years okay. But then when we have to find out the main character, what's the purpose of the story? How is one story related to another? That might be when we start to struggle. Mathematics, again, more of those applied problem solving skills are difficult and geometry with those visual components. Writing, once we get an expressive writing, that's certainly an area of difficulty. If I've had students when they're given a specific prompt and we know exactly what to write down a sentence, we do okay. But when it's more open-ended, we have to come up with our own opening statement, the body and the conclusion, we start to see things fall apart more, which is then in those upper elementary to middle school and high school years. And we look at areas of social, emotional, and behavioral functioning. We've already talked some about how these are also areas of weakness. So might be seeing mood concerns, anxiety, depression, behavior problems, which could be acting out, also symptoms of ADHD or attention impulsivity. We start to make sure, or ch we check with the child as far as self-esteem and self-concept. Because again, if we're Henry wandering through the school, by the time we get to the classroom and sit down, how are we feeling about ourselves? How are we able to then engage in the lesson? So social, emotional, and behavioral functioning, this is assessed, of course, through clinical interviews. So by psychologists talking with the parents and talking with the child, but also rating skills. So we're wanting to get information from parents, teachers, and the child themselves if they're old enough. So these are always very important to fill out if you 
receive these in the in email or in paper form um, because they can then provide some information for intervention. The last area that we assess is adaptive functioning. So self-care and independent living skills, what the child can do completely on their own without help or support. It may be that a lot of these tasks they can do, but they always need parents or caregivers to remind them, to prompt them to get them done. Yes, they can brush their teeth, but no, they don't always do it in the morning, even though it's what they do every morning before school. Mom and dad are always having to remind them. So those are the main domains that we look at. And then we'll have these patterns of strengths and weaknesses. So you'll see here just, which is similar what I do after I do an evaluation, I have my strengths and weaknesses. So we have strengths in that rote verbal learning, simple motor movements, some simple single word reading, decoding and spelling, and also overall weaknesses in attention, but more strength in the verbal types of attention. Weaknesses then we'll see weaknesses in the complex motor movements, visual spatial learning and memory, written expression, like I said, especially when it starts to get more complex, and then social, emotional, and behavioral functioning. These are just a few of the, of course, strengths and weaknesses, but this is what we like to see that pattern fall on when we do an assessment or making that diagnosis or providing that framework for parents. So some common coexisting diagnoses that, as a psychologist, we may be then more likely to assess for specific strengths and weaknesses as an MVLD profile, so like we talked about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, these individuals may be at more risk for an MVLD. Anxiety, and this could be as a result of MVLD. So again, we're wandering through the school, we don't know where we're going, we become more anxious. Difficulty with mood regulation. Like we've talked about autism spectrum disorder, it's not that these individuals with autism will have this profile, but they may be more likely. And again, this is why we might assess more domains with respect to verbal and nonverbal. There's different, different genetic conditions. So Williams syndrome and Turner syndrome. So if I were to be evaluating an individ, individual with one of these syndromes, I would already know ahead of time that I'm going to assess all of the different domains of verbal and nonverbal learning to see if their profile lines up. And as we talked about spina bifida and hydrocephalus, so that's when the cerebrospinal fluid is enlarging our ventricles which then results in typically a nonverbal learning disorder profile. And spina bifida is a good example of individuals with this MVLD profile who are very social. May not always be appropriate, but these, not always, but typically those with spina bifida are very sociable individuals. They can have a conversation with adults in particular over and over again. So it just provides more examples of, yes, autism can be aligned with MVLD, but not always the case. The social social ability just very much depends. Okay, so what can we do about it? I'm going to have this back to Dr. Steck to talk about interventions. So as in any other disorder, um, I think it's important that we know what are we dealing with. Um, so that we start with diagnosis, we then need to do parent and teacher education about, about NVLD. But people often wonder what we can do for intervention. And at a young age, occupational and physical therapy can help with motor functioning and coordination. Um, that's not usually something we continue into later uh, to late elementary school because as kids get older, just their natural activities like PE and playing outside at recess and playing games or doing sports can help with strengthening motor, I mean, strengthening the child and improving motor coordination and functioning. Um, specific tutoring for reading comprehension is often warranted. Um, and so one of the methodologies, but certainly not all, would be visualizing and verbalizing, which is a methodology used in the Linda Mood Bell programs, or it's kind of thinking in pictures as they read. We often find that individuals with NVLD need, need ongoing tutoring in math. Um, just the pace at with which math instruction occurs makes it difficult for them to keep up with the new concepts. They're kind of always barely getting one concept before we move on to another. So ongoing math tutoring, usually keeping it up during the summer as well. 
therapy for the child or adolescent and the family with a th therapist knowledgeable of nonverbal learning disorders. And one of the things I want to say at this point is that um, through the years, we've been lucky enough to work with lots of graduate students or, or postdoctoral students or even new beginning psychologists. And one of the first things we try to help them understand is NVLD because they usually come to CRG with little knowledge of it. And I think most of the um, psychologists or even medical doctors we work with would say, oh, that explains so much once they understand how nonverbal learning disorder impacts a person. So if you are going to have your child work with a therapist or psychologist, make sure they're knowledgeable of NVLD. And you may just need to give them information be, so they become more aware if they're not. Um, oftentimes, medication to treat coexisting conditions such as anxiety, ADHD, mood regulation is very important. There's no intervention that directly improves the nonverbal learning disorder. So what we try to do is find interventions that we know will help the surrounding symptoms. So the motor coordination, the reading comprehension, the math, the anxiety, the depression, uh, because as much as we would, people want to believe there's a cure for nonverbal LD, there is not. Um, so we see a lot of families spend a lot of time energy and financial resources, trying experimental interventions, but we know that trying to address the coexisting conditions is what's most helpful. Just gonna talk real quickly about educational strategies and I'm not gonna belabor these because they're written for you to, um, to take with you, but we know that verbal step-by-step -step instructions and, instruct and instruction is what they do best with. Um, teaching them how to think in pictures, using visual organizers. Um, one of the things we help try to help parents understand is that you can't assume understanding because an individual with NVLD is nodding their head. Nodding their head just means they're nodding their head. You need to make sure that they understand the concept or the instructions by having them reworded in their own words or demonstrate understanding. Um, we find that using an external visual stimuli that you can pair with verbal is very helpful. So like YouTube videos, that's an external visual with a verbal dialogue. Movies of books can help with the comprehension. And I'm here to tell you, I don't care if the movie is slightly different than the book, it's going to help them understand it because it gives them a visual of what's happening. Um, we have to allow enough time um, for and encourage questions. So it will take people with nonverbal learning disorders longer to do almost everything. We need to minimize the time requirement. And this is especially true or tests or activities that require a lot of visual spatial learning. Uh, I volunteer in a fourth grade classroom and this morning I was there work helping in a math lesson where the students had to measure the length of pictures of insects and then turn the page and record that information in the graph and then take that information from the graph and put it on a, um, a linear scale. Well, that was lots of steps and lots of visual spatial information. And I can assure you that if I had been working with a child with NVLD, that probably would have taken three times at least as long as the other students. And that's not even factoring in an attention problem. So we have to allow, especially if there's visual spatial information, more time for them to process that information. So we often need to decrease the amount of work or number of activities to be completed. We need to assist with daily organization, scheduling, time management. Um, 
And I think I've said this already. I must have put it in twice. Sorry about that. There are good points, so they deserve to be in there twice, right? Um, decrease the visual clutter in the classroom and on assignments. Use clear visual support. So a lot of times teachers will say, oh, yes, we have a visual schedule for all of our students. And I'm looking around the room and I can't find it because there's so much visual clutter that it's not clear. Provide a digital clock. The only place in the world that still has analog clocks in every room are school buildings. And these kids do not learn to tell time on an analog clock by third grade, uh, which is kind of the expected norm. That's to the minute. Um, so have digital clocks. Provide an alternative to handwriting because their handwriting is poorly formed, large, and they have a hard time staying on the lines. So when they're young, we can use a scribe, but eventually we want them using a computer or a tablet. Approach students discreetly to see if they have questions. They aren't likely to raise their hand and ask. Provide specific instructions so that the student and the family know what to do when they're completing homework. Use verbal explanations of visual representations. I think Ray gave the example of um, the map that the teacher had, had probably gone over and explained verbally, but without that, it's just a big visual blur to a person within VLD. Allow the student to preview what they'll be reading through use of a movie or, or someone explaining it using pictures to help demonstrate the time period. Extend a time, limit copying from the board or textbook, provide copies of notes. Um, if the student benefits from talking to themselves, allow them a place where they can do that and provide preferential seating near the point of instruction and away from distractions. So we've covered a lot of information um, in a short amount of time. Um, and at this point, if anyone has questions, feel free to enter them under the question uh, tab on your toolbar and we'll try to answer them. As we're waiting to see if there are any questions, because I don't see any yet. Let me see. Um, as we're waiting, I want to clarify just a couple of things. You might have noticed that we use the term nonverbal learning disorders and nonverbal learning disabilities interchangeably. Typically, I think of the term nonverbal learning disorder as a more clinical term. In, in clinical settings, our diagnoses are referred to as disorders. The term learning disabilities are more educational terms. So one's not right or wrong, they really mean the same thing, but I think of disorders as a more clinical term, learning disabilities as more educational. Um, but again, they're they're interchangeable. Let me might clarify. You'll also in the literature see NLD and NVLD. So don't be confused by that either. It's in reference to the same thing. And uh, just like there's no consensus on the definition, there's no consensus on the acronyms to <laughs> To utilize for it either. My own preference is in VLD because I think it's more uh, clarifying and, and uh, communicates a little more, but that's my own bias. So, and interestingly, just like everything else, we go through changes, but I think for a long time it was in VLD, then there was a movement to change it to NLD, and now I think it's swinging back to in VLD. It's all the same thing. <laughs> um, so here's a question. How do you explain a student's NVLD to the student? Great question. I'm going to pass this off to Dr. Kinder. He's had to do this a few times. So um. well, that, is, that is a good question. And um, what I, you know, I, I see a lot of guys, but it would be the same for girls. I'll oftentimes help them understand that everybody's got strengths and weaknesses. And um, and I'll use athletic examples a lot of times to help them understand that because they, they relate to that, that uh, that they're 
teammates on the basketball team or on the soccer field. Some are quicker, some do different things well. Um, so I try to help them understand that th they have a strength and you want to make sure they understand their strengths. Their strengths are verbal. They need to ask lots of questions. They need to get verbal instruction. You know, they're not as strong if they have to process visual spatial information. But that's the same as, uh, you know, is the athletic examples that I give them. And uh, most kids can wrap their mind around it. Most of them already know that they maybe don't do math as well, you know, as some of the kids in their classroom. And I help them understand that's why. Now I say, you can do it. You can learn how to do math, but you need to learn it more verbally sequentially, you know. And so that's one of the reasons to ask questions and get good verbal sequential explanation. And I said, we're going to have a plan to help you compensate for this area that's a little weaker for you. So since Dr. Kendra used the, uh, the sports analogy, he often does that. I think it's a guy thing. Um, just a, a little uh, kind of something I've seen over time is that typically individuals with nonverbal learning disorders, if they, if they play sports, gravitate to playing defense. And I saw that pattern years ago, and it, it, it makes sense because if you're playing defense, you're able to stand back and watch what's unfolding. You don't have to generate the play. Now, again, that's not always the case, but just rule of thumb. And so, you know, I started to listen if, to what parents say, oh, they play defense in hockey or soccer or they're a goalie. It doesn't always mean they have NVLD, but, but if they like sports, that's probably what they're gonna gravitate to. On the sports theme, since Dr. Steck already accused me of having a guy thing bias, um, you, you, for those of you who have kids in athletics, um, there's a lot of visual spatial processing that takes place on a soccer field, it takes place on a football field, it takes place in a, on a basketball court or a hockey uh, rink. And uh, some positions will require more visual spatial processing than others. For instance, you, if you have a nonverbal learning disabled student, and I've had this occasion, when they're young, they can get by with being the quarterback or the point guard. As they get older, not so much, because the, as the sport, um, as they get older and the sport gets more complex, they're required to process more visual spatial information. They don't do it as quickly and easily as others. So if they are a good athlete and they're a quarterback early on, but they've got nonverbal learning disabilities, you'd like to see them transition to a different position. That's, that's not as critical, so. Um, so we have one other question we'll take, and then I, we, in the respect for your time, we'll let you go. So, um, oh no, we've got quite a few here. Uh -oh. um, okay. Should a neuropsychologist be able to discern between NVLD, ADHD, spina bifida, hydrocephalus, executive functioning, and vision issues? Um, and how can you tell what it is, um, what's causing what, and identify the diagnosis when there is so much going on in a kiddo? Well, I'm going to turn that over to our pediatric neuropsychologist and um, I guess the first thing I'm going to say, and I'm going to turn over to her, I promise, um, is that I think a lot of people question whether testing can give you good information. And I, I think we're here to tell you that a good, thorough assessment by someone skilled in interpreting information can, along with medical knowledge, can give you a lot. But let me have um, Dr. Wise respond to that. I will try to. It's over here. You have, might okay. have to scroll out. I will try to look at that to make sure I answer all of the parts. But so, for, oops, so first of all, the neuropsych evaluation, it will look at all of those different domains. And so then what the neuropsychologist should do when they sit down with you is go over, show you the data, and show you that patterns of strengths and weaknesses. So attention. A lot of times it's not so much is it NVLD or attention. A lot of times it's both which also then goes into executive functioning. So attention and executive functioning, those are all the same part of our brain. So typically, almost all the time, when there's a weakness in attention, and there's also weaknesses in executive functioning. For things like hydrocephalus and spina bifida, 
the neuropsychologist isn't diagnosing those types of things. They come, the child comes to us with the former diagnosis. And what we're doing then is does their learning profile fit what we might expect, which is an MBLD profile? Not always. So again, we're not diagnosing it, but what that does, if they have that diagnosis already, what we can say is this is likely the explanation as far as to why they're presenting with this learning profile. For individuals who do not have that neurological condition, we don't always necessarily have a reason why. What we do is just say, this is what their data is showing. I think those are all of the parts of the question. So, um, so one of the things that, um, you know, I think we're going to need to sign off with at this point, and just to say that what we, if we have a medical diagnosis, it can tell us that the child is at risk for certain conditions. Um, we can also take our findings, and if there is no medical diagnosis, give it to the family to take back to their doctor or a specialist to help make sure there isn't um, another condition. It's a little past one, and I know we have some more questions. What I'm going to ask you to do, if you have a question and we haven't answered it, feel free to email it to CRG at childrensresourcegroup.com. That's our general email address. And just put webinar in the subject line. And they'll get to that to us, and we'll try to send you a response to your question. I hope this has been helpful. Um, we do have a number of webinars available on our website that we've done in the past, and we will continue to do them. If you have requests for topics, or if you want a second part of this topic, let us know through that email address, crg at childrensresourcegroup.com. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you have a good weekend.